I am uh, simultaneously both honoured and perturbed that I've been asked to give this talk. Um, <laughs> clearly, um, Sid is the person to give this talk, given his uh, great body of work he's done for it, but uh, he couldn't be here. Um, but he is fully recovered, um, and we can finally all conclude that he really is Superman, um, given the speed with which he's recovered. Okay, so I'm here to talk about Into the Future with SIF. I mean, those of you who don't know me, I've worked with SID for about the last 20 years. Um, working, coming at this from the STAR point of view, and though I generally say I work on STAR, and much of what we've done in STAR, um, because SIF is actually a subset of STAR, has trickled into SIF uh, in one way or the other. Not all of it, but quite a bit of it. But I want to start with my timeline. You've seen several timelines today, <coughs> but I want to look at the timeline it goes back to 1987, the Perth Congress, when Sid Hall, Ted Maslin, uh, Dave Brown, a few other people got together were, uh, where Sid was driving this push, for, was, push was, was the push behind this idea that this thing called email seemed to be catching on really well. And we had an electronic mechanism by which we could start to um, exchange and archive our data. Um, and the ways that were, that were being done at, the, at that time were either binary formats or fixed formats, ASCII. Uh, the fixed formats, you were constrained, you couldn't uh, extend, or they weren't extensible, you couldn't change things around, and he, he, they all thought there must be a better way. About two years later, Tim Berners-Lee, so the Perth Congress was focused on the crystallographic community, Tim Berners-Lee in 1989 started to think about a sim similar problem for physicists in CERN. Highly collaborative, they needed to uh, exchange and uh, transmit their information um, between each other because they were all coming from different countries, all coming to CERN and then leaving again. So he was looking at a mechanism to do exactly the same thing that they wanted, to, that the Congress, pe Congress people in Perth had begun some years earlier. So by 1990, the IUCR adopts a sort of SIF. Uh, this SIF is uh, tag value pairing. There's an interesting uh, loop structure that you can do so you can repeat data. Uh, STAR is also created at this same time. STAR has several more fat facilities, but it's decided that SIF will have a reduced set and be a subset of STAR. 1991, 90, uh, both STAR and SIF are formally published. They are that tag value pair. They take a very, very different view from what's evolving with Tim Berners-Lee, who picks up SGML and goes with a very different uh, structure. Uh, 1992, the beginnings of HTML are sort of formally uh, um, established. Um, it really takes off at that period because you've got things like uh, um, domain names, TCP IP finally becomes a protocol. Uh, there's this thing called hypertext which Vanier Bush talked about in 1948 but the uh, Apple had picked it up in hypercard and then hypertext came along. And there's a whole different sort of idea about the way to pull data on the web rather than to always push it out like an email. 1994, many of you may not know what Starbase is. Starbase became the work engine behind Star. It was widely used by a lot of different groups. I think still used by the IUCR um, today. In 1995, Star DDL came out. So all of this was about data, how to, how to house data. In, in 1995, Sid published uh, the DDL. We started talking about a dictionary now, which was a way of defining something about your data. Uh, it was Fairly rudimentary, uh, but, it was a, but it was a growing um, tool. In 1998, um, um, uh, Berners-Lee generalised HTML, which is very specific, and created this um, more generalised markup language. So we've got HTML and, and CIF, which are specifically got STAR and XML, which are far more general markup languages. So we're all on the same um, path, but crystallographers are a few years ahead. In 2001, uh, the XML schema comes out. So the XML schema is a mechanism by which you can define your XML, okay? mainly syntactic, mainly structural, certainly not at the same level as DDL. And then in 2000, we came up with star DRL. DRL was a way of really enriching the semantic content of a dictionary by adding the methods, etc. We've been on this path since 2000. It's now 2013. Um, so... It was an interesting timeline. We were all, two groups both started on the same path. You had the crystallographers who wanted to uh, describe or define a format 
for the exchange and archiving of scientific data for crystallographers. He had Tim Berners-Lee who wanted to do the same for physicists and clearly somewhere along the path Tim, Tim Berners-Lee lost his way and became incredibly rich and famous <laughs> and, the, and the rest of us stuck to our guns and are poor and anonymous. <laughs> so where are we today? We know that SIFs widely used for the deposition and archive of data in the structural sciences. Certainly structural science is the dominant form. It's mandated by many journals for data submissions. Uh, it's a submission standard for databases, including the PDB, the CCD. It's not the only standard, but certainly they accepted. Uh, CCDC and the OCD. Probably the most advanced of all disciplines in electronic data exchange and archiving. We talk about this very frequently, but there are very few disciplines that are anywhere near where crystallographers are with this. It's probably the most well-defined discipline in terms of machine parsable dictionaries. I think that's true also. There are very few disciplines that have any dictionaries. IUCR, IUCR, IUCR publications extract data directly from SIFs all the time, directly into their publications. Okay? We operate on a very different level. Are we alone? Are we the only people doing this? I would say almost, yes. Many disciplines are still tackling data management 20 years after we started it. They're still tackling the same problems that we started tackling in 1987, in spite of the availability of formats and technology. So, you know, we could argue there wasn't the format, there wasn't technology, there wasn't HTML, there wasn't XML, etc., etc., but all that stuff is there now. SIF's there, STAR's there, DDL's 1, 2, M, they're all there. And yet, Many disciplines are still tackling the same problem. So crystallography's achievement isn't about the technology, isn't about the formats, isn't about any of that. It's, it's solely, in my mind, because of the organisational structure of the IUCR. So you had this body from 1948 until now, it's 65 years, that has been a learned society, a learned group, of which all crystallographers adhere to or are members of, and was able to push... Um, Many of the changes. Middly Sid Hall was um, very important in that push, and Sid can be a very pushy guy <laughs> when he needs to get it, when he wants something done. But he was on the right track, and with the IUCR, uh, managed to get SIF established in 1991 and mandated by the late 90s. I would argue that disciplines that are organised in a like manner, like the IUCR, if they start now, they'll still probably take 20 years. The whole purpose of defining yourself of developing a dictionary is an incredibly long journey uh, and it takes organisation and when you are organised it still takes a long time. <coughs> so SIF into the future. Well the discipline is going to continue to grow, it's going to continue to evolve. You're going to find new science that's being found in the crystallographic community, there's going to be new techniques, there's going to be new data requirements. SIF through its dictionaries and DDL is extensible and will continue to grow with semantically rich definitions. It's been constructed in a way that as things change, it is extensible. So, everything is in place for the future, but what's more, you still have processes for change. When I say everything is in place, it's not as if you're static and that's it. It's all evolving, it's all changing and every year we're working on it. So that's the future. But there are probably three little things I'd like to see in the future. Some of them you might think of as trivial, but they will have some significant impact on the way you operate. Firstly, I'll ask the question. We are the International Union of Crystallography. Are we international? The SIF specification is entirely restricted to the ASCII format. Data descriptors and values are restricted to a, a language. It's English. Okay? You can't really render anything unless you have some sort of um, markup that involves ASCII as well. The, the famous, the angstrom is, you can't even represent the angstrom in a SIF. You have to have it as a backslash A or whatever you choose. So in this day and age, when we talk about internationalisation, I think it's time to accept that the data, for, that uh, we need to accept data in wider character sets. And that is Unicode. So that is a significant shift in how you deal with SIFs now. Because now you've got wide character, wide character sets, which have their UTF-8 encoded. 
mean you have multiple bytes, they're not ASCII. You're not going to use your bog standard Vim or VI to edit. That's maybe a good thing, because you shouldn't be editing SIFs, you should be generating them. So if I wanted to have Joshi Yamanaka in there, now I've, I've rendered this in, in uh, number sequence, just so you could see what HTML is. But if this is actually a Unicode file uh, encoded in UTF-8, you'd see a whole series of bytes which would look like gibberish there. But that's the sort of thing you'd like to see, I think, so that the IUCR can actually publish somebody with their real name, not some Romanized version of their real name. There's other things. You will finally have a character that represents the angstrom um, <laughs> in there. <laughs> so, another question. Are we, is, there, is there only one discipline of science? We're not alone. SIF provides a rich repository of information in the structural sciences. Disciplines use the same definitions or will want to use the same definitions in their domains. We will want a globally consistent view of data within domains and vice versa. So if we're going to start to share data and use data and definitions from other um, groups, from other scientific disciplines, what do we do? One of the issues will be namespace clashing. If we use data items that roughly mean the same thing but not exactly, and we use identical uh, descriptors for it. So you're going to have to start to look at namespaces and how you protect namespaces, how you uniquely ident uh, identify identical data names. If you use the same data name in one discipline as another, how do you separate them in your data? <coughs> namespaces is not a new problem. It's been around for a while. So start to look at the principles of the semantic web. How do you define yourself so that you don't clash in your definitions with other people? So. Internationalisation and sharing of data with disciplines other than ourselves. <clears throat> the last, of course, is what we often talk about, these semantically rich dictionaries that are written in DDL1, 2 or M. Uh, and M has been around for a little while. It's actually a star uh, data language, a data definition language. And I want to show you a little bit of what I, show, what I sh uh, presented at the workshop in the previous two days. So the question is, is, how rich is semantically rich? So what I've got in this system here is I've preloaded uh, one of our dictionaries. <coughs> and I'm looking at, um, if you want to look at what a dictionary looks like, what I've done is um, um, displayed it there. It's a hierarchical dictionary. I've opened it up a bit. I'm looking at one particular thing. The um, Crystal density, the calculated, the, the calculated crystal density, its definition. And what we have in here is, you've often heard of a DREL method. This is what a DREL method looks, lo looks like. It very simply says that the calculated density is uh, formed from the cell atomic mass and the cell volume uh, multiplied by the scalar t its, its uh, term. Very simple. It doesn't know anything. You don't, the dic dictionary definition is simple. The calculation for cell volume or how I get cell volume is not, is not no. I don't need to know it. I don't need to explain it. I just need to put it in there because it's part of the dictionary. So if we go to the data now. Okay. Look in my side. This is a SIF. Now I've rendered this SIF in a slightly different way. It's not the, the standard flat file. I've embedded in it uh, the dictionary tags that lets you know what category you're in. So what's something I need to know? Uh, I have here, for instance, things like, uh, let's hope this works. I don't have the cell volume, but I need to work out the density, which is here. I'll evaluate the cell density. comes back with the cell density, which is correct, I think, because it should be 1.44. And it is 1.44. In the meantime, it's calculated a number of things that it needed along the way in the calculation. The cell orthogonal matrix. It calculated the cell volume, which wasn't there, and gives me the, the correct answer. So what I've done is I've got a, a semantically rich dictionary, which has got some very simple methods in it. The simple fact is, is that I needed the cell volume. The fact that the cell volume wasn't there didn't matter because it's the definition of the cell volume exists in the dictionary. And if it's not there, there is a mechanism for it to uh, be calculated. Equally, you might want to do something like do a structure factor calculation. A 
and back comes your structure factors. There's the original uh, structure factor uh, for comparison. That's the one that's calculated. It's obviously got a different, slightly different uh, nuances. I don't know how the, the, uh, the submitted ones were calculated, but there might be a slight difference in whatever terms we use to, to generate it. I think I switched these to isotropic as, as well, or a mix of isotropic and isotropic. But you can see I've, I've calculated the structure factor very quickly. Part of the way is that the actual structure factor wasn't calculated first. It decided to try, it, the process said calculate the complex structure factor uh, from which it then calculated the, um, the um, real term. And then all these other things got calculated along the way. That's the uh, scattering factor terms for each reflection. So, uh, go back to the dictionary. Let's look at the definition definition for the scattering factor that I used. And there it is. It's about 10 lines of code uh, that says, get me the reflection and then loop over all the atom sites, loop over all the symmetry equivalent sites you've got in there. Notice I've got no index. I'm not doing any of that typical bookkeeping problem that you have in programming. The first one establishes what the scattering factor is, so pull out the, the multiplicity, the occupancy, uh, the scattering factor table for that particular atom type, and also the dispersion for that atom type, and then loop over the symmetry operators and execute uh, uh, the exponential of the, uh, the um, HKL times the um, rotational symmetry vector times the density of the tensor the tensor for the specific atom, et cetera, et cetera. So there it is. That's, that's actually the Fourier transform to calculate the structure factor, the complex structure factor, actually, uh, in about 10 lines of code. Quite easy to understand uh, because when you look at it, Because when you look at it, that's what it looks like. There's the actual formal definition that you'll find upstairs, up at the top there. I'm dealing with a reflection, uh, a specific reflection. I'm going to loop over. I'm going to do a summation over all my atom sites. I'm going to do a summation all over my symmetry operators. I'm going to determine the form, fact, the form factor that I need, sorry, the, the scattering factor that I need. And then I'm going to um, do some calculations. Now, all of these are different, OK? Some of these are, these are all established as associative arrays, matrices, vectors. So what I've done is done all the operator overloading. This is actually a vector times a matrix times a vector transpose. Okay? It's all there. It's all using the same operator, okay? the product operator. If these were scalars, if these were scalar terms, that would be a straight multiplication. They're not, but that's done dynamically. It's found, it, finds it, it determines it dynamically what's on either side and does the calculation of the appropriate calculation. And then you've got the term up there, which is the uh, um, temperature term, and then you've got the term up there. So you can see they don't look that different. So it's a very simple language, yet very expressive, and does exactly what I remember writing in Fortran 20 years ago, which took a lot more lines than that. And most of those lines were keeping track of indices and indexing in my data structure. In this case, the language knows what star is and knows what SIF is, knows what the data structure is and handles it for you. You just ask for something. So there, uh, you know, I ask for um, the form factor table. I ask for the symmetry multiplicity. I ask for the atom occupancy. It's for a specific atom. Remember that, OK? So which atom? Well, that's, that's controlled by your looping st structure there. It's telling you which atom you're at at the time and pulls out the appropriate x, y, z, the appropriate uh, tensor den the beta tensor, t tensor term, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, what do we got? We've got uh, the concept of the future of domain dictionaries. We've got a dictionary shell. I'm going to start to pull in sub-dictionaries. So the whole of this is all constructed. By the way, what I showed you was star, but it looked a lot like SIF because we've actually reconstructed a SIF dictionary in star. <coughs> um, so I can pull in all the sub-dictionaries sub I want. Okay? And I can split up all of the core SIF into those forms. I can pull in other dictionaries. I have a dictionary for the IUCR, IUCR office where I actually have other methods in there to do all their valid, not all, I won't say all, some of their validation for them. 
So it's all driven by the dictionary. You just change the dictionary, you've got new validation methods in there. I'll import attributes, I'll import common values. Once I do that, that actually becomes my domain dictionary. I've got a data file now that I can pull in to my dictionary. With the use of DREL, I can do all the calculations I want. This is not to replace crystallographic computing. It won't do that. You've got highly optimised code that you use all the time. This is just enabling you to define very, very concisely your terms. Add to that the ability to extend types and add functions back into the language of DREL, and I think you've got a lot of what you need. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.